If you think it's time to take a hammer to your bathroom scale and rip up that diet rule book, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi everyone, it's Rebecca Scritchfield, author of Body Kindness and host of this podcast. I'm a health at every size dietitian, a certified exercise physiologist, a former chronic dieter, and a mom to two girls. Join me as I talk to guests about what it means to be good to ourselves and create a better life where well-being matters, not weight. Through these conversations, we'll reveal the challenging and surprising ways our culture keeps us searching for our worth and our appearance. Let's create a new view of health that's inclusive and built on compassion. Let's shake things up a bit and let's change the game. Hey listeners, did you know that you can get a free mini Body Kindness e-course? Visit bodykindnessbook.com and click get started. When you give your name and email, you'll be signed up for the course and you get a video reflection guide, a sample chapter from my book, Body Kindness, and I'll be checking in with you over email. I hope you sign up. And I also want to let you know if you're thinking about a little bit more support, I have two options. One, you can join a web-based group with the self-reflection prompts from me, and you can get that in a three-month trial visit bodykindnessbook.com slash spiral up. And I do one-on-one private coaching sessions. If you'd like to learn more, shoot me an email, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. Or, you know, I've been called animal names since I was like in fifth grade. So it's nothing new. Like these people haven't gotten more original, but land whale is one of them. And I was like, yeah, whales are awesome. And I live on the land. And I think I need to wear like, a swimsuit on the cover of this book. So we made it happen. That was Jess Baker. Jess is a positive, progressive, and magnificently irreverent force to be reckoned with, who preaches the importance of body autonomy, self-love, mental health, strong coffee, and even stronger language. And on that note, I will give you the heads up now that although all my episodes are given the explicit warning that this is definitely one for the old headphones should you be around wandering ears or in public places where you don't want to hear some language because it did come up. Anyway, um, Hopefully you already know Jess Baker, the militant baker, and you're already following her. You're already a fan. Hopefully you've already read things no one will tell fat girls. And hopefully you have already pre-ordered or will be ordering right now her latest because it is out. It's called Land Whale on turning insults into nicknames, why body image is hard, and how diets can kiss my arse. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, um, you are going to love the show today. I love Jess Baker. I'm going to make sure you get a link to our original interview where um, she's the first one who really got it clicking for me about how to erase diet culture. You really need to address fat phobia, and I'm forever grateful for her to that. Um, we spent most of our conversation today centered around a few of the chapters in her latest Landwell. Um, chapter eight, it's about health at every size, hot mics, and other things I, I learned about the heart hard way. Also chapter nine, I never owned a body and chapter 13. So have you ever thought about dieting? Um, and I think you're going to get a lot out of this conversation. I respect Jess Baker so much, her past, present, her vulnerability, her honesty. Um, I think you're really going to love Land Whale. I, I think you're going to get a lot out of our conversation here, but there was so much that she covered in her book um, that we just were not able to get to. And this is a real... Um, a vulnerable memoir for her. So she writes about her troubled relationship with her stepfather and his own body image issues, um, overcoming her fears of intimacy, physical and emotional. And she talks a lot about trolls, which is where um, her title came from. But I'm so excited for her to talk to you more about that. I also love her shout outs to uh, many fat women who are serving as role models of body acceptance for her and many of the ones she listed. I am already um, a fan of or have interviewed or would like to interview soon. And yeah, I really just think you're going to appreciate how she takes a thoughtful examination of the stigma around weight loss surgery and the fat positivity community as well. Um, I really got a lot out of that in reading Landwell, although it was not a topic we got to on the interview. So with that, I hope you really uh, enjoy the listen and I hope you go out and get your copy of Landwell. Do not forget she has taken the book on tour. So if you're lucky enough to be in one of the areas where you can check that out, be sure to meet Jess and get your copy signed. Yeah. 
Hey, Jess, welcome to Body Kindness. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you again, and I am going to make sure that in these show's notes, I give listeners the link to the first time you came on, and you were actually my first repeat guest. That's very exciting. (laughs) Uh, But you know, you really, I, I, I don't know if I ever had a chance to tell you this, but truly, when you came on you know, the first time I was like, yay, things no one will tell fat girls. I can't wait to talk to Jess Baker, da, da, da. And then you said, well, Rebecca, if you really want to eradicate diet culture, you better start working on eradicating fat phobia because fat phobia is the whole reason why diet culture exists. And it was like, what? What did she just tell me? And and no one ever said that to me before. And it literally changed everything. So thank you. <laughs> that sounds like something I would say. And also that's very blunt. I'm glad it <laughs> hit well and didn't like, you know, punch you in the face. <laughs> oh, I, you, I, it was, it was like uh, ice cold water on the genital areas. It woke me up. <laughs> I was kind of like the bidet of <laughs> like a wake up call. <laughs> yes. But the ice cold bidet though. Woo, oh my gosh. I got to pay attention to this. <laughs> And you, yeah, no, no, I'm so glad you said it and you were just so, so right. And it, it, it made me become more brave at whether it's using the word fat as an, as, as an ally, using the word fat phobia, explaining that connection to people. So, um, yeah, you're quite, you're quite the life changer in my opinion. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, so I, we are now talking about, uh, your latest book. This is your second book and it's out now. So super excited for that. And I would just love to dive in by talking more about the title. So the title is Land Whale with a long subtitle that I don't remember, but it's like body image is hard and diets can kiss my ass essentially. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I, I just feel like that title needed to be on a book. And it's, you know, kind of like a in a way that we reclaim fat, this is just another way to reclaim fat. Something that, you know, if you're online and visible and fat, haters are going to call you a lot of animal names. Or, you know, I've been called animal names since I was like in fifth grade. So <laughs> it's nothing new. Like these people haven't gotten more original, but land whale is one of them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, whales are awesome. And I live on the land. And I think I need to wear like a swimsuit on the cover of this book. So we made it happen. Yeah. I, I love the cover. I, I'll never forget when I first saw it and just, just the whole thing about it. It is like two middle fingers really high at anyone who's ever just tried to make you feel like a piece of shit about yourself. You know, it's like, screw you, screw the insults. Here I am unapologetically me, myself, smiling, happy, And yeah, I'm going to take that insult and turn it into something that I'm going to embrace and change the meaning of it. I love on the cover how you could still see people in the ocean in the background. Like (laughs) It was by no means like a quiet, uh, isolated shoot. And people were like, what's going on? Who is she? What's happening? And it was really cool to do it in a public setting too. And in the book, I do talk about how certain things like being called animal names and white animals are awesome. Um, that those don't affect me, but also I think of an important conversation to have is how much that harassment and just like emotional violence does affect people. Mm. So land whale has both. Like, I feel mm-hmm. like we need to be talking about both. Yes. Middle fingers. And also the bullying and the emotional violence are very real and very traumatic. Right. Um, and so it was, that was another It was a middle finger to talk about it, but Mm -hmm. I was being very honest about how much it it does affect me. You know, it's kind of changed who I am um, and not in a way that I would wish on anyone, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point that it's, you know, people could be like, oh, well, sure, it's easy for Jess Baker to do, right? And it's, it's, and what they're going to get out of it is actually, no, these things really hurt and, and we need to do everything we can to stop the bullying and stop the shaming and stop the name calling. And at the same time, find our, find our resilience through it because we deserve more. We deserve better. Absolutely. Couldn't have put it better myself. Oh, well, I loved it. I read it cover to cover. Um, so I I just love to know, like, why, why did you need to write it? What was calling you? 
I felt like, especially after writing things, no one will tell fat girls, which I totally still a hundred percent stand behind. Like, I feel like it's a really fundamental book. I was recently with a group of women who were just starting out on acknowledging the concept that maybe they didn't have to hate their se- themselves for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. Um, I found myself recommending things in Hotel Fat Girls because it's kind of like <laughs> the foundational basics, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, here are the core facts you need to know and some tips to challenge the stigma that you've learned. So that's important. But I also wanted to go beyond that conversation because I've moved beyond that conversation. Mm. And what's really, I'm getting goosebumps kind of talking about it. And it's just like sheer... Uh, terror and anxiety <laughs> that these are kind of, it's not like excitement it's like <laughs> not <excitement>. fear <laughs> just baker fear. is afraid uh-huh i am and my like body's reacting to it <laughs> these conversations are ones that we're not having in the mainstream so when i wrote things no one will tell fat girls we were kind of just getting started on this body positive mainstream train and now i want you know at this point place in my life, I wanted to take it beyond that into these very nuanced, complicated conversations that are happening, but are very, they are seemingly limited Mm -hmm. and very complicated. And so they get really messy. And if there's the thing I love about books is that you can have a whole conversation cover to cover, as opposed to a one-off blog post or a thread in a Facebook group, like we can chat I'm putting that in air quotes, um, we can chat about things in a, a deeper way. So I wanted to kind of capture that. It's terrifying to me because these are not necessarily popular opinions. And yes, it's my life. And that's just like truth. But also I bring up these really hard questions that even I don't have answers to. Like, I don't know. Is It's kind of like the more you learn, the less you know. And mm-hmm. that's Land Whale in summary. <laughs> Well, yeah, you did bring up a lot of important topics and 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 shared a lot of, you know, your personal experience which I think really helps readers. I think readers want to connect and it helps us emotionally, you know, kind of feel heard and seen um and so, you know, like I think that they'll they'll get the benefit out of hearing you bring up difficult and uncomfortable topics, but also in a way where readers who have also been there will feel a connection. And for those who maybe haven't been there might be able to understand and learn and grow a little bit more. Um, I hope so. I hope that both of those things happen. There's a dedication by Ijoma Luo in the beginning. It's a quote by her. Mm -hmm. And instead of like dedicating it to someone, I was just like, this quote was everything to me. And it was something that she said in a conversation we were having just like offhand. She is just brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it's something along the lines of we've been trying to prove to the thin world that we are worthy for far too long. If you're going to be brave, be brave for the fat people. And so I really took that with me as I finished writing this book. And I was like, man, this is terrifying. This feels way too vulnerable. And then I was like, whoa, you're thinking, you're thinking about too many people. Yeah. Um, Would, do you want other fat people, like, would this benefit them? And that was more important than um, my comfort zone for me. Yeah. Yep. No, and it comes out in the writing. I think it was a very important decision. And yes, Ijiomo Luo, she's amazing. Her book, So You Want to Talk About Race, amazing. So in there, you talk about, you say that you grew up mortal enemies with your body. Uh, I think a lot of people could probably relate to that. Can you kind of give me a sense of what your relationship is like with your body today? Yeah, I think instead of mortal enemies, we're working towards a truce. Mm, Nice. (laughs) We're Yeah, we're working on it. We're not quite there, but I think we both have a lot more compassion for each other. What I've really been trying to do ultimately, like my goal right now is to connect my mind and my body. And in this culture in diet culture, just in Western culture in general, where we treat mental illness and physical illness completely separately, right? As if they're not connected completely. (laughs) We have had that connection taken away from us. Um, It's kind of, you know, like I think of it like shoulders down, we've been disconnected from our body and it is a huge relationship to heal that, that connection. And so 
you know, and for a while I was, I didn't even think I would ever get there. I thought I was, you know, too fucked to be fixed. That's mm-hmm. really the way I, I felt even a year ago. And so through these, these small moments and really great experiences I've had and people that I've talked to, they've becoming a little more, they're like thread, like bridges. Mm -hmm. They're very thin, but I've been having these bridges connect and it feels like a really beautiful thing. And I have so far to go. Like there's so much work to be done, but we're working on it. Um, I like that I'm talking about my body and my mind as if they're not me, but it feels <laughs> <laughs> we're all working together. You're all in there. <laughs> yeah. We're like, all right, we need to sit down and process this shit together. So yeah. we're having that conversation, my yeah. body and I. It's great. Yeah. And and it's it it reminds me of like the idea of of evolving, you know, like if we stop to be like, okay, our like if we stop to be like, oh, our bodies are projects and we always have this work to do, you know, like as opposed to just all your experiences help you learn and grow and evolve in positive ways. Um, and so, you know, like you seek out what's the, you know, like what's the next helpful thing that my mind and body and my soul, you know, need. Yeah. Um, what uh, you talk a little bit about body liberation, and I love how you talk about like uh, you say that it's okay to not know. But what what would body liberation mean to you personally? I think ultimately, instead of learning to like love my body, which is where I started out, which is fine. That's like a great first step, um, and I had to go there in order to get here. But instead of learning to like wanting to love my body and to like look in the mirror and be like, "You're a sexy bitch." <laughs> um, like, that's a nice feeling, but I don't mm. need to have it all the time. What I would rather have is acceptance so advanced of myself as a whole that my body kind of fades into the background a little bit as much as society will allow it. Right. We have to like remember external oppression and how like we can love ourselves all we want, but we're still going to have oppression in the world around us. And that's true for so many people on so many levels. But I want it to fade into the background as much as is possible and just think it and appreciate it for what it is and live my best life without it being the focus. Like I'm tired of obsessing over my body, whether it's negatively and hating it or positively and trying to obsessively love it. I want it to be neutral and wonderful and just a part of me because there's so many parts of me. And I want it to be just another part. And this body does amazing things. Like it gets me so many places. It heals itself. It literally keeps me alive. There's so much life to be lived that I want to be able to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that what I really appreciated about what you said is the idea of that, like you do your best, you know, despite what culture is going to do because it is going to do it. I was like almost in tears the other day when I was talking to Deborah Gard and she's like, you know, Rebecca, like we might not live to see the day where like weight stigma is totally eradicated. And I was like, no, we got to make it happen. You know, like I was, I was really sad and upset by it. Like, what do you even mean? Cause in my mind, it's like, yes, we are not giving up until there's freedom and there's, you know, but I think with your approach, it's like body liberation means that you acknowledge that, that the cultural system and the things that are happening are going to bump up against you. But you are doing the best you can with the things you have control over Why, while you work to fight it, no matter what the outcome. Right. And there's so much important work happening. You know, there's all go that app. That's all. It's basically a Yelp for, are you familiar with it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm super so cool. excited for it. And they, they made their Kickstarter. For those who don't know about it, it's a kind of like a Yelp app for um, size and places. So you kind of rate on accessibility for size and soon it will turn into other things as well. And like, those are tools that we've never had. So we are seeing some progress. Mm -hmm. I would agree with Deb. I don't know if I will ever see that in this lifetime. And um, that's tragic. And I think we can hold space for that and grieve it and also um, work towards doing the work to as much as we can. And (laughs) like, no small order, right? All of these things and work on our own internal liberation so that we can live the best life that we can. And that looks different for everyone. Yeah. So I, I think it's really hard because we really want clear defined outlines of what that looks like. And we want clear steps on how to get there. But 
that's all kind of just this wishful thinking. Um, it's messy to get there and it looks different for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And culture is going to do what it's going to do. And so to try to expect it not to come in and harm you is just going to disappoint you when it does. And so it's more about what can I do on with myself and my family and my community and things that matter? And how do I have my resilience for when the inevitable bullshit happens? I think that's a great point. Part of this liberation is creating resiliency. Yeah. And I think we all have to do that to a certain extent. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Cool. Um, yeah. And I'm excited for that app too. I mean, for, for my own benefit, I mean, I would want to ask them, say, hey, let's support the businesses that are inclusive. Let's support the businesses that, you know, don't try to ignore 70 some percent of Americans who aren't thin. Yeah, absolutely. Have to first ask about the mansplainers on college campuses. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. That's um, okay. But, I wrote it. I know. But they, <laughs> they said something to you that I was like, it was like nails grating on a chalkboard because it's happened to me too, like with fellow dietitians who didn't quite get it, like literally invading my personal space with like finger pointing and angry, bulging eyes. <laughs> and it's scary even just to be in that scenario. But it's basically the line, well, I just don't agree with health at every size. Yeah. I think it comes up with a lot for anyone who's trying to let go of, you know, chronic dieting and self-love and compassion and body kindness. But even there's been many more helping professionals who, who are really wanting to completely obliterate the way they're providing care. And then we come into conflict with our colleagues. So Help, help enlighten us on this issue. Well, I think I am not a physical health professional, mm -hmm. uh, but that does not mean that I have not read the studies or talked to the people who are leading this conversation and do have the background mm -hmm. um, and all of the degrees. And science t and logic tells us that when it comes to weight, when it comes to things like PCOS, when it comes to eating, when it comes to nutrition, we have it literally backwards in that we are blaming things like weight for PCOS when in fact it is PCOS that causes weight gain. It's that kind of thing where it's literally like, and, and this is what we're taught. And I can't tell you how many dietitians I've met that were like, I did not learn any of this even through my master's degree, you know, like th this is just not taught even something as simple. I had this great conversation with a, a dietitian who was like, I didn't learn about PCOS until I was almost finished. Like yeah. this diagnosis yeah. that so many women have, yeah. I didn't learn about this until I was almost through my master's degree. Yeah. Nobody talks about it. So it's, it's this missed conversation. And you can talk to a lot of people about why this happens, but essentially it, behind the fact, I think it's really important that we remember that medicine and dietitian, like dietary mm -hmm. everything and clinicians and eating disorders and all of that, it is not a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Like we're looking at something that is supposed to generate money and uh, dieting is the most brilliant scam of them all because <laughs> essentially um, you are starving your body or depriving you restricting. So your body is trying to keep you alive. And what we see is that diets don't work. And not only do they not work, you go through this hella traumatic experience, your body freaks out, and then you ultimately end up gaining more weight, which then makes you diet again. And it's just it's just, it's just perpetuating the problem they have sold you this diet to solve. And so it, it blows my mind that we're still teaching things so backwards. And, you know, there's nothing more dangerous to me than like a pre-med student uh, because they're like, they're young, their frontal lobe's not fully developed and they have like an amazing amount, like a little bit of information and an amazing amount of hubris because <laughs> they're in academia. And those are the people that challenge me the most, but you will find dietitians with PhDs who have never heard of this concept. And I'm so glad that, you know, finally we're getting some research and some credible, quote unquote, credible sources out there that are backing this up. But, you know, Linda Bacon will be the first one to tell you that you can present someone with pages of evidence. And we are so bought in to the, this is the way it works. And we, we almost think of doctors as like deity, you know, like we don't, we don't challenge them. We don't know how to advocate for ourselves. That's not, that's not just by chance. That's on purpose, but she'll, they will uh, present pages of evidence to people and they will still come back at you with that. I just don't believe in health at every size. And it's like, 
okay, well, I'm not sure what else I can do for you. Um, But we can take this message to people who are looking for healing and connecting their minds and their bodies again and, and regaining control of their ultimately regaining life, like autonomy with their life and their body and their mind. And it's, there are good people doing that work right now. I yeah. know you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. You're one it, of them. Oh, thank you. That's so yeah. kind of you. I feel like it is is going to be a force that the powers that be, right, cannot ultimately control, which is what is needed. Because I have in recent experience had where how how money is made off of weight management, quote, <laughs> certificates for dietitians and all that stuff, where if they are willing to engage in conversations about health at every size, so like in the newsletter and a blog post and a speaking engagement, it's all set up, this is going to be a debate. Right. And it's right. like, it's ridiculous that, right. like, why a debate format? And it's like, you clearly don't even get that, health at every size being a social justice movement and all the intersections it has, you know, and you're right. There is also research too. I think that when people come up and end up saying, I don't believe in health at every size, your point of, I don't know what I could do with you. I've learned to just say, okay. And almost like drop. It's not that it's, I feel part of me that just wants to kind of convince them with it's a flip chart or shake them or I don't even know what, but it's like, I have to say, you know, maybe this person isn't my person because it's one thing to come and say, help me understand. Right. You know, versus, well, I just don't, you know, debate me. I just think it's so it's, and, and so, and not everyone is fixable. And so for anyone who's listening and somebody's like, they're, they're bumping up against you. like, maybe you don't need to help them. Maybe you just need to know what is true to you and how embracing self-care and well-being and the concepts of health at every size, how it's helping you have a better life. And you don't have to convince everyone else. Well, I think a couple things. Can I share a couple things? Yeah, sure. I, th- I think that medicine and just even nutrition has been turned into dieting. Mm-hmm. I think I think of it as like a religion. And it is. A lot of religion, organized religions are businesses and rackets. And, you know, up until the age of the internet, uh, they largely went unchallenged in certain ways until people had the ability to find um, more information and really some answers online. And we, I think in the beginning, we kind of saw this like drop of participation and not to say there aren't like billions of people. So of course I respect people's beliefs unless they harm people. And that's totally fine. But I think that we're we're starting to enter an era where this information is becoming more available. And so, you know, we're not just being told by doctors. We're able to do our own research. And so that is pretty powerful. As far as people who don't who do come at you, like I don't believe in health at every size instead of explain to me how this works, those aren't my people either. I'm not here to prove to anyone that being kind to yourself and connecting with your body and finding intrinsic value is like a great thing. Like (laughs) if you're not up for that, we don't waste my time because Mm -hmm. there are so many people out there who are suffering because of those people and I'm here for them. And Brittany Gibbons really puts it succinctly so beautifully where she was like, I'm not here for the assholes. I'm here for the people who suffer because of those people's actions. And I'm here to help them build resiliency, help them build their arsenal of tools and for them to live better lives. And I, and I feel like that's where, you know, in the very beginning, I did want to try and convince everyone. And that is just, it's a waste of energy for me. So come along for the ride if you want to, and you are more than welcome to. And, you know, I know there's people on the fence that are kind of just like, "Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe not. That's fine too. But I'm, I'm here for the people who really want to embrace a more liberated view. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just, and, and I'm a hundred percent there too. And I've just gotten this point where it's like, and it's okay for them to be where they are. And if they give me information that they're not my person in this space, that's okay too. It's their life. And they could kind of like walk on because I need to put my energy into the person who is truly curious, who I trust that my effort in educating them and giving them some things to think about and read, you know, could lead to them learning and growing and some good things in the world. And 
this is not to say that even if somebody is curious and you hand them the information that there isn't going to be this like overwhelming, maybe even resistance if they are interested, you know, because it's so much to take in. And for, for a lot of people, it's the first time they've ever heard something so radically different than what is preached through headlines. And so, you know, it takes a while to absorb. It's taken me years to like, I've been researching this and learning about it and teaching it for so long. And then it's a totally different process to implement it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just a very (laughs) long process. And so maybe, maybe you, you know, walk into it kind of hesitantly and that's totally fine, but opening up our, our minds and kind of looking at the science behind psychology and just physical wellness and the combination of the two for a whole, like whole body healing is really important. Yeah, I agree. Well, I was wondering if you would do us the honor to read a paragraph, one of my favorite paragraphs um, in the book that is titled, So, Have You Ever Thought About Dieting? And um, Isn't that the ultimate question for every (laughs) fat person? Have you ever tried a diet? (laughs) I've got some advice for you. I've never heard of those. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a great chapter, one I could relate to. I know many of my clients and listeners can relate to. So I wonder if you'll pick us up on the paragraph that says, there is. Yeah. Okay. So this is before I talk about how I started dieting at age 12. Uh, it says, there is so much perfunctory feel-good bullshit that seems to go along with our participation in dieting. Whether you're in the midst of a newest trend in food restriction or contemplating which diet book speaks to your soul, you will inevitably be met with backpacks and copious amounts of encouragement. Make no mistake, all that praise is a purposeful tactic to keep you coming back. Word. Word. And then in the rest of the chapter, you go into the numerous ways that you have, right? Somebody else says, oh, just try this. And that all kind of led to actually just more body suffering. What 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 did you want the reader to get out of this chapter? Well, I think I think writing it for it's, this book is kind of selfish in a way. Um, <laughs> I had to do I had to do a lot of digging and healing. There was some satisfaction that came out of writing out what I did to my body for so long and putting it into words and being like, what bullshit, you know, like when you like take a step back. So for me, it was maybe that's a takeaway for a lot of people is like feeling sad, drink slim fast, feeling unhappy, drink slim fast, feeling happy, drink slim fast. Like what were we doing to (laughs) ourselves? My God. Um, but I think too, like a lot of us have been there, you know, we try one and it doesn't work. And then we try another and it doesn't work. And then we try another and it doesn't work. And and the interesting thing that I've gained this with this perspective is that my body, if I didn't diet, if I didn't grow up in a in a world that told me I was broken since I could understand the concept of fat and what it meant, if I didn't diet in order to try and change that, because 95% of women don't naturally have the bodies we see, you know, in the media that we we praise so much. So I I am definitely one of the part of that 95% because diversity exists. But if I didn't have all of that and I didn't go on all these diets and I didn't wreck my my body from the inside out, you know, I, I, I think that my body would be more conventionally sized, which is fascinating because now this diet culture has created a body that is less within its bounds of acceptability. And it's given me this opportunity to embrace it as it is. And it's almost like a curse and a blessing. And I think it's really interesting. And I am all I'm all for it. I'm game. Like this is the body I have. I'm so grateful to have this body. And, you know, it's kind of forced me to be like size and weight is irrelevant completely when it comes to so many facets of my life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, it's, look, we have, life is a gift, you know, in and of itself. And we are always thinking and feeling something with our very human brains and we are emotional creatures. And yeah, it's like, what is it that we want to be doing here? And the amount of time we could spend in a negative space conforming 
trying to conform and never feeling like no matter what we do, it's ever going to be enough is it keeps us stuck in self-blame and self-shame. And as opposed to, I am not fucked up. Culture is fucked up. What can I do with this realization? What can I do about things now that actually are more in line with helping me feel better, have a better life, let myself feel the love and connections and the relationships for people who want to connect with me and who care about me, you know, but I'm sitting here kind of stuck in my own infinite loop of you suck that was put in there by a culture who never wanted to accept me for who I am. Yes. And purposefully excluded us so that we would constantly try and find that solution, which inevitably would make money. I think that this kind of conversation in in some circles would lead to nutrition and then evolve into dieting. And I think it's like this slippery slope. And I want to make sure that listeners know that I am not advocating for any of that. That that has no place in my life. And I want to make sure that we are clear that this conversation is very much fat positive. Yeah. But there is a way, I think, to be fat positive and also deal with the, with both sides of the feelings, right? The empowerment and the grief. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the reason why I wanted to have you read the paragraph was because I was so floored and grateful to see the last diet you put in the list, um, which is the lifestyle change diet. Yes. Because this is the thing. This is the thing that keeps me up at night. If I see one more social media picture of a thin white woman making a green juice and laughing in the picture and saying, make life better. And this is, you know, it's like diet culture now is taking things and saying, oh, but this is, this is just a lifestyle. This isn't dieting. And I think it really ends up hurting people. And so, you know, oh, it's just a lifestyle, but follow these rules forever. How that really messes with people. Yeah. I mean, really wellness culture is our new diet plan. Make no mistake. Those are completely inextricably connected now. So and it's very exclusive. You have to have money. You have to have a certain body type. You have to have time. You have to have time. And the like, you know, for me, mental illness is a huge, is a huge part of my life. So, you know, some days I don't feel like getting out of bed. And so, (laughs) you know, those who don't have to deal with that, like it's, it's easier for them to participate in diet culture slash wellness culture. I think where we get really tripped up is, and I'm mad about this. I'm mad that wellness culture has not only Slash diet culture. We're just going to know that it's diet culture when I say wellness culture. (laughs) Um, I'm not talking about wellness because that means a million different things to a million people. Wellness culture, which is what we're perpetuating right now, that not only strips you of your self-esteem and money (laughs) and time, but it also strips you of actually like feeding your body on a very like new, like on a new, it takes nutrition. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, like we're really just leveling up in our fuckery. It's incredible to me. It takes nutrition. It takes fiber and like all of these different components that we need to, and protein and like, you know, all these things that we need to balance and it makes it into a diet. And the reality is that if you're restricting and your, your decisions are a reaction instead of an autonomous decision, Mm -hmm. which by the way, is so hard for us because we've never been taught how to listen to our bodies. I'm, I struggle with that daily. Like, you know, so anyways, it's taken all of that away from us as well. And so I started reading intuitive eating at the prompt of Dana who works with Be Nourished. She's a non-diet. I love diet. her. Yep. She was on. Uh, yeah. it's, it's good to be rad about radical dietetics. I love her. So cool. Yeah. I, she's she's doing amazing work with yeah. Hillary. So Be Nourished, she's a non-diet dietitian. And she was like, just read intuitive eating and do not read the nutrition or movement sections. Mm-hmm. And I tore them out <laughs> of my... Like, Didn't you set them on fire? Because I feel like I saw that on social media or maybe I only saw you rip it up, but I maybe I it was a, it an image of a fire, but I loved yeah. that. Yeah. I threw them away. I don't yeah. have them. <laughs> and because a year ago... I would have taken that very fundamental, like 
you know, there's so many components of food that we need to like coexist so that they work off of each other so that we have energy so that we can survive. And I was so, so disconnected from that, that if I were to read that fundamental stuff, I would have turned it into a diet. Mm -hmm. based on restriction, based on shame, based Mm -hmm. on guilt, based on what other people tell me to do. So I could not read it. And I'm just now at a place where I'm able to look at what I like to call like food variations or maybe food modifications, Mm -hmm. things. And this, this can be really triggering for some people. So this is not where you're at, that you don't need to be there. You can make, you can make decisions about food, however you want. Like if you want to eat seven cakes a day, do it. If you like, whatever it is that makes you happy, because I think when we talk about survival too, we're, you know, I, right now I'm talking about our body, but mental survival, I think is where like my primary focus is. And there's, we need a lot of things. And so if eating seven cakes makes you happy, do it. If, you know, eating seven boxes of donuts makes you happy, do it. If just drinking green juice makes you happy, do it. Just don't Instagram about it because that's boring <laughs> as fuck. <laughs> just kidding. It's your life. Don't do tag you. me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> don't tag me. I'm done watching green juice. And so, you know, I don't really, I don't really um, blog about this stuff yeah. because it's, we're so oversaturated with it. So, so you don't, I think there's rebellion in showing fat people eating food unapologetically, but I don't think there's as, I don't think it's needed to watch like fat people eating salads. Like I feel like just that just reinforces this visual image that we don't really need. So I don't post that kind of stuff. I see certain people using the body kindness hashtag on social media and I'm like, you're doing a weight loss contest. That's not body kindness, you know, you know, or just this thing where it's like, but what's the harm in this lifestyle change thing? And it's like, if it's not bringing you joy, if it's not flexible, if it's not giving you life, if it's not the kind of thing that you can do forever, it's not real liberation. It's not real flexibility. It's not real trust. And everyone's always shoving health down our throats that it makes wellness culture, right? That sick version of wellness culture, it makes it look like that kind of harmless and that we only turn our nose up at the extreme version of it. But it's just like, you're just replacing rules with rules and you're not really kind of working on being okay with yourself and your food and your body. Yeah. Okay. And I, that's a really great point. I think the things to contemplate just in general are joy is joy. Mm -hmm. Does this bring me joy? It doesn't matter what kind of joy does it bring me joy and kindness. You mentioned kindness as well. Am I being kind to myself? I think, you know, I have a note up here from Dana that says normal eating is really flexible. And I think that's really important for people to remember. And I realized that talking about food is really triggering for people. I think a year ago, I would have like turned this podcast off. (laughs) I don't want to talk about food because I'm not there yet. So I hope that this isn't bringing up too much shit for people. But I think I was just, I'm really mad that we've even destroyed nutrition, you know, Mm -hmm. like connecting to that so that we can fundamentally survive because we need food for survival and we've just ruined all of it. So I am in a place where I'm looking at modifications uh, for, for food because of PCOS. And it's a very specific thing that's happening inside of my body. And there are things I can do to keep my body feeling stable. And guess what it is? Balance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're not taught balance. And so it kind of blew my mind because I went to this, to a dietitian that was a non-diet dietitian. And I was like, okay, what would you recommend to help keep my body, you know, feeling stable and energized? And she was like, oh, just balance, balance, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> no need to take away, just add a couple things here and there, you know, and it's all about adding, not taking away, adding things. And so it just blew my mind. And yeah. she, in no, like in no way was her suggestion restriction yeah, at all. And so we really do approach this healing, uh, in such a backwards way. Yeah. Well, and it's not, it's not healing if that's the approach. Um, I know your time is short. I have one more question. I had a lot more questions, but we're running out of time. I would love to hear from you if you can imagine three years from now and we're all sitting here saying, okay, things are better. We're going in the right direction that would make just the world a better place to be, like you said, in the front of your book, not for the thin people, but for the fat people. What is it? What are we doing? What have we accomplished Because I think we need to look at that so we can think about what we need to do next and where we need to go with this. 
Does three years from now is such a short time. <laughs> <laughs> Five, ten. <laughs> in in a perfect world, um, I think that we would embrace diversity of bodies. There have always been and there always will be fat people. Yay! Just, it's just a fact of life. Yes. And to pretend that they haven't always existed is ridiculous. So embracing diversity of all kinds would be ultimately the best. And when it comes to size, letting fat people just fucking be like, let us do us, let us live our life. Let us make our own choices, our own decisions, and let us move at whatever pace we want and stop shoving healthism down our throats because it harms me, it harms you, it harms everyone. And I think that that's kind of what people don't get is that fat phobia affects everyone. It doesn't matter if you are the, like the thinnest person on the planet, like the fat phobia will negatively impact you as well, because we will always be afraid of fatness. And so we just really have to get rid of that fear. And that is a huge ask because it is just embedded in our system. We have created multiple markets around this, not just in advertising, but in our clinical and medical spaces as well. So it's a huge ask, but we really just need to get rid of the fat hate. And once we do, people will have the chance to talk to themselves and say, what is it that I really want out of my life? What are the choices that I want to make? And we will have more, I think, liberation and freedom. So yeah. fucking get it together, world. <laughs> get it together. Leave us alone. Like, And leave us alone and fight this battle against fat phobia with us. Because ultimately, it works in everyone's benefit. Ah. Uh. I'm raising my hands at you and saying, yes, preach. I'm showing up to the Church of Jess Baker every day of the week. <laughs> it was so good and fun talking with you. I know so the book, Landwell, is available everywhere, and I know you're going on book tour. So how can people find out how they can meet you and get a copy of your book in person? So there's a great website for this. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Everything, yeah, everything Landwell related is going to be at Landwell the book.com landwell the book.com everything's on there you can sign up for updates you can buy the book you can see tour dates and hopefully i'll get to meet some of you guys in person lots and lots of people so much good wisdom to share with the world i appreciate your time today thank you so much jess thank you And that's our show. Let's continue this conversation in our Facebook group. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and ask to join the group. We also love ratings and reviews. Please subscribe to the Body Kindness Podcast and give us an honest rating and review. And if you can, tell a friend. If you'd like to support the podcast for the 2018 season, please donate at gofundme.com slash bodykindness.com.